Hey there, everybody. This is a live look right now from King County's elections office as the ballots are being counted and we should be getting results sometime in the next half hour. Thanks so much for joining us for this digital edition of Your Voice, Your Vote here on ComoNews.com and on the Como News Facebook page. I'm Eric Johnson. And I'm Mary Nam. Throughout the evening, we'll bring you results, analysis, and updates on the races from Seattle all the way to our nation's capital. And we are joined by Como News political analyst Ron Dotsauer of Strategies 360. We have team coverage for you with reporters standing by at various election <coughs> headquarters and watch parties throughout western Washington. And we are also tracking some of the top national races throughout the country. The chair of this Washington State Democratic Party. Please Molly Shen is standing by in Bellevue, where she is keeping track of the Senate race. And Molly, what's happening in Bellevue tonight? the numbers. Well, we should be right back in about half an hour or so when they drop from the Secretary of, of State's State office. State we'll turn the TVs back on so folks can well see what's going on elsewhere in the country. And we can't wait to talk to you about the results here in Washington now, State tonight. So we're having some audio issues. We can't hear Molly's mic. We're going to work on that and get back to her in just a moment. Murray's opponent, newcomer Tiffany Smiley, is watching the results alongside other Republican, other Washington Republicans at the Hyatt in Bellevue. And that's where Cummins Lynn Ann Wynn is live. So Lynn Ann, this race is much closer than first anticipated. Yeah, well, things are just getting underway here. You can see the crowd behind me, big cheers as they counted down to the polls closing. They're keeping an eager eye on any developments here behind me. A lot of supporters uh, for Tiffany Smiley here tonight. Big cheers as her name was mentioned. They're expecting her to speak a little bit later tonight. Uh, Washington GOP leaders uh, cautioning voters here tonight that to be patient, they don't believe that uh, anything will be called tonight. They say that they expect many Republicans in the state to be voting late and for those votes to come in throughout the week. Now, we did speak to voters here tonight who say that they have hope, but they do know what they're up against here in Washington State. Voters acknowledging that this could be a close race as the polls predicted. We'll, of course, keep an eye out for any developments here, but for now, we'll send it back to you. All right, Lynn thank you. Let's bring in our political analyst, Ron Dotsar, with Strategies 360. So the incumbents typically have a huge advantage over their yeah. newcomer challenger, but this race, anything's but guaranteed. Absolutely. Well, listen, things are always dicey in a midterm election, right? Because the power uh, that's held by the White House, the party that's out of power, i.e. the Republicans in this case, usually have a leg up in the election cycle on a midterm election cycle. So that has the effect of being a little bit of an equalizer. It's not all of it, but it just certainly has helped. It helps a challenger um, in the political dynamics of a midterm election. So um, as and then as a consequence of that, frankly, she ran a pretty good race. You know, um, and I, I thought the, frankly, I thought the production quality of her TV's pieces were better than Senator Murray's. Yeah. Um, and, but I think at the end of the day, and we chatted a little bit about this, you know, I think that the King County vote is probably going to take Senator Murray over the top and probably carry her back um, for another term in, at the U.S. Senate. We're going to get back to Molly Shen in just a minute at Senator Murray's party, but let's let's talk about that race real briefly uh, that Smiley has run on point all the time and persistent. It seemed like she was hitting it and hitting it and spending the money. We really haven't seen anyone spend that kind of money against Senator Murray, have we? Oh no, never. Not just her money, but the independent expenditures. You know. Um, we're pro we, they, they, the candidates themselves probably spent 35 to 40 million dollars in this election cycle. Amazing. Just the, that's their campaigns only. I would submit that probably you can double that with the independent expenditures done by either the Republican Senate Campaign Committee or the Democratic Senate Campaign Committee. There is probably 80 million dollars spent here in Washington State on this U.S. Senate race. And so it, it and money matters <laughs> in the race. And she got enough money. Because this what usually happens with incumbents like this. They've they've taken up all the money. The money is is usually in the coffers of the incumbents, and the challengers struggle to to raise the money. And because the RNC and the RSCC all came in big for her, um, they it created her a, a bit of a wave, right? So the money kept coming, and so she got very competitive on the money side. Going to be interesting. All right, Gonna let's be go back out live to Molly Shen with Patty Murray's watch party. What's the atmosphere there like, Molly? 
Uh, well, Mary, it's a big crowd has gathered here. I think last time when we were trying to talk to you, you were hearing Tina Podlodowski, who's the chair of the Washington State Democratic Party. She came out for a few minutes to just help hype up this crowd and get people excited, talking a little bit about some of the other races that are happening nationally. Here you can see the crowd that's in the room gathering. It is a festive atmosphere right now. And uh, when Tina Podlodowski was out, she talked about some of the victories that Democrats are seeing in other parts of the country. And obviously that got a lot of big cheers from this group. What they're here for, though, what they're all waiting for is to hear from Senator Patty Murray. Uh, Representative Dr. Kim Schreier is here as well. There's a big focus here as well on the Secretary of State's race. And Representative Susan Del Bene is here tonight, too. So uh, that's who people really here want to hear from. We know it's going to be a little bit, though. I was just talking to some people from Senator Murray's campaign, and they let me know that with results just coming down around 8 o'clock, they can't say for sure when we'll hear from her. We do expect it to be within the next hour, uh, probably a little bit more like 45 minutes or so from now. So, of course, we're going to stay here and uh, keep on top of what people are feeling and saying here, and we will bring you comments from Senator Murray as soon as she comes out onto the stage. Back to you. All right. Thanks, Molly. And one race that just crossed the wires, AP now confirming that Texas Governor Greg Abbott wins re-election over heavy hitter Beto O'Rourke with 63 percent of the votes counted. He was up by about 800,000. So that just crossed and just got confirmed by AP. Uh, they have confirmed that for Texas. Now, let's go to some key U.S. Senate races. Uh, when we brought this to you earlier in the evening, things were kind of flip-flopped. Tim Ryan now uh, trailing J.D. Vance, and some are calling it for J.D. Vance. AP has yet to do that yet, uh, the Republican there in Ohio. As we switch over to Georgia, this has been very interesting, watching this between Republican Herschel Walker and Democrat Raphael Warnock, the incumbent. Now, Herschel Walker is leading by around 20,000 votes, with 74 percent of the votes counted. Now, things are starting to really slowly trickle, and things were moving really quickly for Warnock in the beginning, then Herschel Walker caught up, and now he's leading. Uh, as we switch over to uh, the U.S. Senate race here in Wisconsin, uh, Ron Johnson, now ahead of Mandela Barnes, the Democrat, by about 20,000 votes, another key U.S. Senate race, and they're in uh, Pennsylvania tonight. This is also very interesting, watching John Fetterman and Mehmet Oz, the Republican, uh, going back and forth here. Now, John Fetterman led by sometimes up to as much as 200,000 votes at the beginning of the night as those early votes came through, especially from the Pittsburgh and Pens in the uh, P Philadelphia area. But now, as you can see on your screen, we're only about 50,000 votes, maybe 45,000, something in there. That's pretty much the closest it's been all night. So these are going to be uh, very closely watched. We may not know the results tonight. We possibly could, uh, but it's going to be a wait and see for many of these. All right, Preston, thank you. And Preston just walked us through some of the latest numbers coming in on these national races. Ron, what are the key national races that we should be paying attention you to? You bet. Well, one of them we just talked about, which is Pennsylvania. That is a, criti a pretty cl critical race for the Democrats in the in the control of the Senate. Um, out here in the West, we have two states, particularly Kathy, Kathleen Cortez Mastro in, uh, in Nevada, Nevada and the astronaut in Arizona, mm -hmm. although he seems to be doing fairly well, but the Mastro race is just, with Laxholt, is just, has been neck and neck on the polling, and that's a really closely watched race. So you've got uh, Pennsylvania, Nevada, um, Arizona, um, are the three, I think, critical races in, in terms of what's going on in, in control of the Senate. Um, obviously, this race here in Washington State is kind of a, taking yeah. on new importance as well. So, But I'm, I'm particularly interested in the, in the Fetterman race. And then, obviously, the one we was all talked about is Georgia, right? Georgia and, and, and Pennsylvania, Nevada, Arizona, therein lies the key to the political kingdom. Okay. Ron, if, and a lot of people have predicted in the last few months, really the last year, that the, the Republicans would take over at least part of Congress. Yes. Um, if that happens, what's the message, uh, what's the takeaway for Democrats? What can be learned from this? Well, I, you know, people are going to try to get overcomplicated with this, and I don't think they should, because really what happens, history tells us so much about politics. What we've learned over the last 80 years, and we talked about it earlier, the, the party that owns the, that's in the White House loses seats in their first midterm elections. Barack Obama, in his first midterm elections, lost 63 House seats. It just happens. It just happens. The average is a loss of 25 seats. So a lot of pundits are going to sit here and they're going to roll their hands, they're going to talk about what this pretends and that pretends and so forth. History is telling us what happens here, okay? And yes, there'll be some, 
you know, there'll be certainly some mid-course corrections, you know, but there'll be overreactions on both political parties to these midterm elections, and they just need to sit and just relax and say, look, this is how, this is how the system works, whether you like it or not. So live with it and understand that in two years from now, there'll be an opportunity to, to flip it back. So what, what could be very interesting, I think, in the House is that, I mean, who's going to be running that? Who's going to be running that ship? So it'll be, they, they could be, you know, the Republicans, if they, don't, if they steer too far to the right, because mm -hmm. that's not where the American public is, they could get themselves in trouble and they could be in a lot of trouble in 2024. All right, Ron, you mentioned one of the key races happens to be the U.S. Senate race versus Tiffany Smiley versus the incumbent Patty Murray. Let's take a look at those numbers rolling in, if we can have that graphic pulled up for you. Do we have that, you guys? There we go, 59% going for Tiffany Smiley. Patty Murray currently behind 41%. What do you make of those results? It is the very first drop. Yeah, well, first off, those are Eastern Washington numbers because those small counties in Eastern Washington are very quick to count their numbers. So those numbers um, I w would not take to the bank just because where they're coming from. That's what's the tricky about looking at these numbers and reading what, what they mean. But I would submit that those numbers are coming from small eastern Washington counties, and there's probably nothing from Kieran Pierce, the Homish, and the Puget Sound region. So I would, at this point, to be honest, I would read almost nothing into those numbers. Just 2% right. reporting. Yes. Let's go over to, to Preston right now to talk about the Secretary of State race. Preston? Yes, these numbers also just coming in now, and you can see Julie Anderson ahead by about 9,000 votes ahead of Steve Hobbs here. So Democrat Steve Hobbs trailing Julie Anderson uh, prefers a nonpartisan party. So this is the deal here. So we're seeing these early numbers come in again. It is very, very early. Uh, we are not seeing that many votes. Total votes right now, 32,000. So there are a lot more votes uh, to count here. And you can see it on the screen right now. These are the latest tallies we have now coming in from the Secretary of State's race. Now, at the same time, we're also getting in some results uh, from uh, Snohomish County here in regards to uh, the prosecutor's race. And right now, uh, Cummings is ahead of Brett Rogers, police lieutenant with SPD. So we're watching that race closely as well. And as we get more results, we'll bring them to you right here on Como News. All right, we're going to go live now to Jeremy Harris, who's uh, following the race for District 8 between incumbent Democrat Kim Schreier, Republican Matt Larkin. A lot of money spent on this race. Como's Jeremy Harris is our man on the ground there. He's live in Bellevue tracking an election that Washington Republicans really hope to flip back to red. Jeremy, how's it feeling out there for you? Yeah. Absolutely, Eric. This is a very hotly contested district in District 8 here. It's a district that was Republican for many, many years up until 2018 when Representative Kim Schreier won her election, flipped the district to Democrat. She is now fighting tonight to try and keep it. Now, that we have not seen the candidates here at the watch party yet. They're back with their teams watching those initial uh, dumps of ballots that have been coming across. But her supporters are here. They are confident that she will win re-election. But again, it's all about those numbers when they do come down. We did have a chance to catch up with uh, State Senator Patty Cooter from here in Bellevue a little bit about what she's looking at and, and what she anticipates may not have a result tonight in some of these races. Clearly, there was no red wave, and I think, you know, what we're looking at tonight are were some very competitive races. We expect that the voting will go out because we are a vote-by-mail state, and it's going to take some time to actually count those votes. Now, both the Republicans and Democrats have their watch parties here in Bellevue tonight. We do have a crew at the Republican uh, Party as well. Watching that very closely, of course, Matt Larkin and Kim Schreier. They ran very competitive races, each kind of going at the other, and, and, and Kim Schreier making an emphasis to say she is very pro-choice. She wants to protect a woman's right to be able to choose to have an abortion. There were some hotly uh, contested issues in this about public safety. Matt Larkin alleging that Kim Schreier was, uh, of course, she say he was saying that she was too soft on crime. That was an issue that went back and forth in the campaign. So both candidates, very hot race. And really, right now is the time when this is going to come down. We're going to start seeing some of those initial ballot numbers. But even the Democrats here saying it's okay if we do not have results tonight could potentially uh, be tomorrow or later when we start getting more of the uh, ballots that are counted. So we'll keep a close eye here on things we are expecting to hear potentially from the candidates, starting with Patty Murray, maybe sometime in the next 30 minutes or so. Back to you.
All right, Jeremy, thank you very much. We're going to take a look back at that Patty Murray, Tiffany Smiley race. And, <laughs> well, there you go. It looks like at this point anyway, with this uh, amount of votes, what is it, 33% reporting, 61% for Patty Murray, 39% for Tiffany Smiley. This would seem to be... You know, a little more expected than those first batch of numbers we right. saw. The, the the lead there is approaching 300,000, or I guess it would be uh, of 200,000, a little more than 200,000. Ron, I think that would be, if you told uh, most people in the state of Washington that that would be the result at this point, you know, in the, in the uh, election, then no one would be surprised particularly, no, they right? they would be shocked. That's why those first numbers were so, I don't want to call them deceptive, it's just where they come from mm -hmm. matters. Now, what you've seen now is, a, is a, what we call in the business a dump of votes, probably from the Puget Sound area and probably from King County. And that's why that number will probably swing back a little bit. But again, where they come from, when they're counted, all matters. And so I'm always cautioning people not to get over amplified about some of these early numbers and just wait it out a little bit as, the, as it settles out and you get a better sense of what's going on. I want to ask you a quick question about yes. uh, Patty Murray's campaign. She's going for a, you know, a sixth term. Yes. I, I would call it a very unaggressive campaign. Would you agree with that? She doesn't seem to take many chances, doesn't go out on a, you know, on a ledge at all, just sort of stick to her points, stick to her points, plot ahead, and she usually, yeah. she usually wins. It's, I would call it a, a fairly pedestrian effort. Yeah. But it's enough, you know, because she has, she's, listen, she has a track record. She has a track record of accomplishments, you know, and I think that they got that message, enough of that message out there, particularly by, in my opinion, the independent expenditure was where I thought were the, the better production of the TV spots on her behalf was better than the, the campaign stuff itself. And so as a consequence of that, that was really helpful to her in developing the message. So yes, I mean, she's got a track record. She's delivered a lot of things for the state of Washington um, over her 30 plus years. And so voters are, are very sophisticated about this. Um, now again, I, the, the race will probably tighten. Um, I, I, that doesn't mean that tighten to the extent, I think we predicted earlier that Patty Murray was gonna get reelected and I, I've never wavered from that. And heck, she may get close to the number we had in September, you know? Well, I was going to ask you, Ron, you just said you wouldn't be surprised if, if the race became closer, maybe yes. even a lot closer. But the reality is the Republican committees, I mean, they're holding on to millions of dollars. They would never give it to a candidate unless they thought they actually had a fighting chance. Right. And they thought Tiffany Smiley did. $12.8 million, right? Or more. But, but part of it is... Part of the Republican strategy could be, well, you know what, let's make sure Patty stays at home with her money. That she's not raising money and giving it to other Democratic mm. U.S. Senate candidates around the United States. So it's a small investment on our part to make sure that she sits on her wallet. <laughs> okay? So there's other sort of strategic moves that are going on here that ne didn't necessarily play in the outcome of the race. But that, is, that could have been some of the thinking that was going on. All right. Preston's over there at the live desk fielding the numbers. What do you got for us, Preston? we got a few new results coming in. And this is one of the things Ron was talking about. The Senate race here in Arizona, astronaut Mark Kelly, uh, up by about 200,000, 240,000 votes here in Arizona against Blake Masters, a Republican. So we'll watch this closely. Again, it's still very early in the night, but there's 47% of the vote turns uh, coming back in right now. So I don't know if this is a huge shock there in Arizona when it comes to Kelly. He's been polling pretty high. Uh, but with these two, this is where we're standing right now. Let me drop over here uh, to, let's see here, to Pennsylvania. This is the Fetterman versus Oz race. So we've been watching this with Fetterman with a huge lead for most of the night. And now it's down to about 50,000. Now, Pennsylvania has been slowly counting these numbers tonight. This, uh, they are not fast when it comes to bringing in the numbers. They're probably one of the slowest. A lot of people are talking about that online tonight. Uh, but right now, Mehmet Oz is trailing by about 50,000 votes. So that's it's pretty much as tight as we've seen that all evening long here in Pennsylvania. And then the other one we've been watching very closely is here in uh, the U.S. Senate race in Georgia versus uh, Herschel Walker versus Raphael Warnock. And now we're seeing Herschel Walker pull ahead by a little more than 20,000 votes. 84% of the votes counted. So uh, we're getting close. But if you know, if you see the percentages there, it, you know, at this point, we're looking like a potential runoff. No one's polling above 50%. So uh, that's the way this looks. A lot of people are thinking that could happen. But again, some are thinking that Walker could pull out this win tonight. But we'll just have to wait and see some very close but very important races here we're looking at. 
All right, thank you. And here's a look at some of the latest results for the U.S. House right now. Take a look. District 1, Susan Delbeni, incumbent versus Vincent Cavallari. She's ahead 72% to his 28% with 21% reporting. In District 2, Dan Matthews versus Rick Larson. Uh, Rick Larson jumping ahead of Dan Matthews 61% to 39%. Again, less than 30% reporting. In District 3, Joe Kent versus Marie Glusenkamp Perez. It looks like the Democrat currently ahead of Joe Kent 53% to 47%. Wow. In District 6, Derek Kilmer against Elizabeth Kreisel Meyer. And that doesn't look close. Derek Kilmer hanging on 61% to 30, uh, 39%. As you see those numbers in District 7, Cliff Moon, the Republican challenging Pramila Jayapal. Cliff Moon didn't really ever appear to run a serious campaign, didn't make much headway there against Jayapal, who was such a very high profile, both in our state and nationally, 85% to 15% in that race. In District 8, Kim Schreier, the Democrat, the former pediatrician, again, Matt Larkin. Interesting race. Yep. Was uh, supposed to be a tight race. Look at these numbers, Ron. 54% mm -hmm. for Schreier, 46% for Larkin. What do you think of that? Number one, Kim Schreier, I think, ran a, a smart and strategically driven campaign as I've seen in a long, long time for a congressional seat. She's, she's, this is a redistricted, I mean, a redistricted seat for the first time after the redistricting. And so it was, it's a slightly, pur it's a purple lean Republican district. But she attacked the district right from the get go. As soon as that redistricting was done, she spent time in Chelan County, in Kittitas, mm -hmm. and other places that are traditionally sort of Republican votes. And from my sources tell me the Larkin never showed up, you know, in Chelan County. And I had the opportunity a couple of weeks ago to, to attend a debate over in Ellensburg between the two of them. And I'm here to tell you that, that Kim Schreier took Mr. Larkin to the cleaners in that debate, substantively, stylistically, in every which way but loose. And she has just run, I think, a very, very, very solid, superb, solid to superb campaign. And as I say to folks, campaigns matter. I want to hold you right there. I'll get you to bet. a couple more of these races. You bet. If we can go back to the graphics that we had going there, Adam Smith against Doug Bassler. Uh, can we get back to that? I'm not sure if we can do that or not, but that's an interesting race to me. There you see uh, Smith, 71% to 29%. What I think fascina is fascinating about this race is that Bassler has run against Smith in 2014 and lost, <laughs> 2016 and lost, mm -hmm. 2018, 2020, and now 2022. He just keeps getting up. He's like that guy in the Raging Bull. I'm still here, but he never comes close to Adam Smith, who's I, a real juggernaut. I think Adam's paying his filing fees. <laughs> <laughs> in district. 10. Keith Swank, Marilyn Strickland, the former mayor of Tacoma. And look at this. Yeah. Uh, Strickland, 57%, and Swank, 43%. Yeah. Ron, what do you see as the top House races to watch for in our state? There's two of them. It's the 3rd Congressional District in Southwest Washington. Mm -hmm. It's an open seat. We had Kent take out the incumbent Republican in the primary. And he is, by every characteristic and definition, what you would call a right wing Republican. He was endorsed by General Flynn, you know, the Republican nominee for governor and, you know, and Donald Trump. Um, and he actually had some problems with the Republican Party in Clark County because some of the leadership down there were sort of turning on him because he was so far, so far ideologically to the right of the spectrum. Um, I still thought he might have a chance to win because that is a re that's a lean Republican district. So you got the third Southwest Washington, and then we just talked about Kim Schreier in the eighth. Those were the only two seats that were really in play, but I'm, they're both in play. I'm going to have you hold right yes. now because for our digital viewers, we need to break now to prepare to go live on Como TV to update our viewers there. We're going to go to black for a couple seconds, and then we'll be back online for you, okay? So hang tight.
Hello, everybody. We interrupt your regular program, scheduled programming with a look at some of the results starting to come in on this election night. I'm Eric Johnson. And I'm Mary Nam. Let's get to the results for one of the biggest races of the night. Senator Patty Murray facing off against political newcomer Tiffany Smiley with 48% of the precincts reporting. Patty Murray sitting ahead of Smiley, 57% to 43%. Como's Molly Shen is live in Bellevue at Senator Patty Murray's watch party. Molly, what's the atmosphere there like? Well, Mary and Eric, I have to tell you, this room actually just burst out in applause because even though you just gave us those numbers that are early in this counting process, one of the networks that's on here in the room just put up Patty Murray's picture and called her the projected winner. So you can imagine how this room exploded in seeing that. Now, that network might be saying that and the room might be celebrating it, but I can tell you that Senator Murray's campaign would certainly not be declaring victory yet at this point. In fact, they let us know that they were anticipating this to be a close race. The polls leading up to tonight have told us that it would be tight, and they warned us they might not be able to say who was the winner and who has lost this race tonight. They reminded us that back in uh, 2010, when Senator Murray had a tight re-election race, it wasn't until the Thursday after Election Day that her race was called. It was the second-to-last U.S. senator race to be called in that election. So tonight, perhaps it will be that way again. We'll see, of course, as the these numbers keep coming in. I do expect we'll be hearing from Senator Murray in about the next half an hour or so. Back to you. Uh, Molly, thank you. Let's head over now to Tiffany Smiley's watch party. Como's Lynn Ann Wynn is live in Bellevue there, where Smiley and her supporters are keeping a close eye on tonight's results. Lynn Ann, they can't be happy. Well, it's very quiet here. As you can take a look behind me, the crowd looking at the results right now. They're expecting uh, Tiffany Smiley to speak here in the next half hour or so. Washington GOP leaders here cautioning voters. You can hear those boos. Washington GOP leaders cautioning voters here tonight to be patient. They don't believe the vote will be definitive tonight. They say they expect a lot of Republicans in the state to be voting late and for those votes to be coming in throughout the week. Now, we did talk to some supporters here tonight about what kind of sealed the deal for Smiley. They say they really connected with her backstory of her husband who was wounded in combat and how she helped advocate for him to continue his service. And they believe that she will advocate for them. And we talked to them about kind of what they're up against here in Washington State. They said that they're aware um, that the Washington State has not elected a Republican to the Senate in about 30 years, but they're still holding out hope here. So we'll send it back to you for now. That hope diminishing by the minute. Now to a look. Thank you, Lynn and at some of the other races we're watching. The seat for District 8 is a heated race between the incumbent, Kim Schreier, and a Republican challenger, Matt Larkin. Here's how things are shaping up so far. Schreier, 53% of the vote so far, and Larkin with 47% of the vote. Now to the Secretary of State race where incumbent Steve Hobbs has 50% of the vote to Julie Anderson's 47%, and that's with for, uh, 54 percent of the precincts reporting so far. Now to the race for King County prosecuting attorney. Interesting race. Dan Satterberg is retiring, so this is the first time in 44 years that no incumbent is running for that seat. Whoever wins this race will have a tough job, and as you can see right now, Lisa Mannion, 56 percent, the chief of staff for Satterberg, ahead of Jim Farrell, who has 44 percent of the vote. Como is your home for tonight's election coverage. And don't forget to join us for our digital show. That's airing on our Como News Facebook page and on our website, comonews.com, right now as we speak. See you there.
right. That's the way it works on tele television. We're back with you right now. We were live on the web, took a break, did a cut in, and now we're back. Maybe you heard just a little bit of that. <laughs> it's about <laughs> 8.30 now, which means it's uh, we're getting our first election night results. We've been passing along to you as soon as we get them for U.S. Senate in the race between Senator Patty Murray and Tiffany Smiley, again with 56% of the precincts reporting. Patty Murray comfortably ahead of Tiffany Smiley, 57% to 43%. We have team coverage on this race. It is such a big one. It has been so captivating for the last few months. We're going to begin with Como's Lynn Ann Wynn live from the State Republican Watch Party as Tiffany Smiley hopes to end Senator Murray's near three decades in Congress. But Lynn Ann, it doesn't look, at least right now, like that's going to happen. Um. Yeah, well, as they watch those results come in, it's been a little bit more subdued here than it was earlier in the night. I want to show you the crowd behind me as they eagerly look at some of these results. Supporters here, though, still holding out hope that Washington State will elect its first Republican senator in almost 30 years. They've been told earlier tonight multiple times by Washington State GOP leaders to be patient. They said Republicans tend to vote later, and they do expect to have a clearer picture as they count the votes throughout the week. Now, we did speak to some supporters earlier here tonight who come from a military background about kind of what sealed their vote for Tiffany Smiley and they say they really connected with her backstory of her husband who was wounded in combat and how she helped advocate for her him to continue his service and they believe that she will advocate for them now Smiley is expected to speak here in the next half hour or so and we will be here of course to bring you that as it comes in so back to you for now all right Lynn thank you and meanwhile Senator Patty Murray campaigning to her sixth term let's check back in with Molly Shen live at the Democrat watch party in Bellevue. A much different atmosphere there, Molly. Yeah, absolutely, Mary. As you can imagine, it's very jubilant here right now because of these early numbers coming in. We actually haven't seen any of those numbers that you just gave showing Senator Murray's lead right now in the early results. Uh, but the room knows. They know that there have been some good results coming in. I've had a number of people actually walking by trying to peek at my computer screen, which I have up, showing the counties as they come in. There are just three counties, if I've got the latest results, that haven't reported their first batch yet. They are all in eastern Washington. So perhaps that'll mean a nudge for uh, Tiffany Smiley's campaign tonight. But at this point, with those numbers you showed, Patty Murray does have the lead. People here know that. And I think they're feeling pretty confident. I told you just a short time ago that her campaign had let us know actually yesterday that they didn't think that they'd be able to uh, declare victory um, on either side tonight. But I'll be interested to see when Senator Murray does come out onto this stage uh, within the next half an hour or so, if she does feel more comfortable that with that based on these early numbers that we have. I do understand that Senator Maria Cantwell will be the one who will come out and she'll introduce Senator Murray. Uh, we also do have uh, Representative Schreier and Del Bene here tonight. So we expect we'll be hearing from them as well. And so far for all three of them, it is victory thus far. Obviously, it's still very early, but a lot of options optimism here at the Westin Hotel in Bellevue. Back to you. All right, thank you very much. And here's a look at some of the latest results coming in for the U.S. House right now. For District 1, incumbent Susan Del Bene ahead of Vincent Cavallari, 64% to 36%, with just about 60% of the precincts reporting. In District 2, Dan Matthews versus Rick Larson. Not even close. Larson isn't even breaking a sweat. 62% right now to 38%. He's got about a 40,000 vote lead. In District 3, Republican Joe Kent versus Democrat Marie Glusenkamp Perez. Take a look. She's ahead 53% to Joe Kent's 47%, with just over 60% of the precincts reporting. In District 6, Derek Kilmer, Elizabeth Kreisenmeyer. And as you can see, Kilmer easily winning so far 62% to 38% in that race. In in District 7, Cliff Moon against Pramila Jayapal. You had a feeling this was going to go this way. Moon didn't really ever get anything going, didn't really seem to be trying all that hard. He's trailing 85% to the incumbent to 15%. In District 8, Kim Schreier versus Matt Larkin. She's ahead 53% to his 47%. In District 9, Adam Smith, the incumbent against Doug Bassler. He's beaten Bassler again for the fifth 
time. Uh, he's running against uh, Adam Smith every a couple of years. Doesn't seem to be working out for him. 71% to 29%. And in District 10, Keith Swank versus incumbent Marilyn Strickland. She is comfortably ahead 57% to Swank's 43%. Let's check in with Ron Dotsauer now. Strategies 360 has been nice enough to hang out with us all night long. Ron, what are you taking from what we're just describing to you now? What are you seeing? Pretty much what you expected? Yeah, it, it, it's, it's interesting to note that almost every one of those Democratic incumbents that are over 60 percent because they've never been they haven't been seriously challenged. What's interesting is Congresswoman Del Benny used to be in a district that was a swing district. Redistricting helped her. She now has a district that leans Democrat, so she's now getting 60 percent of the vote. The other side of that coin was that that uh, Dr. Schreier picked up a piece of that district that wasn't so healthy as far as Democrats are concerned. So she had a tougher district to run in. And so it's interesting, and I think, again, as we said earlier, she's run a really good campaign, and that's the reason she's leading tonight, with a 53 to 47% margin. And so she, she sort of deserves that because she's earned it. Um, and then we have a little bit of surprise going on in the third district, which is, you know, Kent, is re it's a Republican district, but this guy is, if, if he were to win, would be the most conservative republic in, in my 50 years ever to serve in the House of Representatives from the state of Washington. How and about I can that? say that. I can say that flat out because this guy is, as we used to say in the business, he's right of a tea of the hun. And so he is just that conservative. Now, may, he may have crossed over as being even too conservative for the third district, which is a Republican That's district. That's hard to do, right? It is hard to do, but he may have done it. We'll see. Again, it's a little early, but we'll watch. You bring up a really interesting point, and I have a feeling that a lot of um, Republicans watching are thinking the same thing. We're in Washington state is known as a blue state, but a lot of that evidently is because we don't have a lot of GOP candidates running serious campaigns. So what, why is that? Good question. Something that I've been saying for a long time doesn't, but anyway, the, the, the GOP has continued and regularly to put up candidates that on the ideological spectrum are so far to the right as to not be acceptable to the general voters in Washington state who by and large center themselves pretty squarely in the middle, okay? And, and they, they're gubernatorial candidates, you know, this Joe Kent guy down in the third, and even Matt Larkin is, a, is not a moderate in Dan Evans, Slade Gordon mold. He is a very, very conservative Republican. And if they ever figure this out, we could have much more competitive races. The problem is they just keep putting up, in my opinion, the wrong candidates. I think we all benefit, the, we all benefit if we have competitive races for every seat. To, and, to your point, yes. I, I want to point out that Joe Kent, you mentioned that he might be even too far to the <laughs> right uh, for the 3rd Congressional District. He called the January 6th insurrection an intelligence operation. Bingo. That might not, not have worked to his favor. Not so much. But again, that's a, it's, a, it's a Republican district. Um, and, you know, and so we'll, we'll see what happens here. But he, he is really, I mean, his campaign is all about what he can do to attract the MAGA Republican constituency. And whatever he can say to that group, that's what he's caught up in, okay? You want to talk about the Congresswoman Green? He's the male ver version of Congresswoman Green from Washington State. Interesting. We'll get right back to you. Big race here locally is, of course, for King County Prosecutor. Dan Satterberg is retiring after a long run. Jim Farrell, the Federal Way Mayor, against Lisa Mannion, Satterberg's Chief of Staff. And right now, Mannion <coughs> is winning this rate 56 percent to 44 percent, a fairly comfortable lead there for Lisa Mannion. Como's Tammy Mutasa has been following this race for us. Lisa, what do you, or Tammy, what do you have for us? We've lost oh, the great Tammy audio. Mutasa. She can't hear us. Dang no, she it. can't hear us. Right now, look at her. She's shaking her head. Dang what the heck's it. going on? Well, <laughs> um, well, listen, either Farrell or Mannion is going to win that race. Either one of them, whoever wins, <laughs> has, has a huge job, a backlog of, of 4,500 yeah. cases to go through. I mean, that's a tough job. It is a tough job. You know, and I don't know that the public really understands all that entails within that responsibility of being a prosecuting attorney. It is the chief law enforcement officer in King County. And so it is, it, it, it looks like they've had two pretty good candidates running for the office, you know? And so um, either one of them, I think, can do the job. 
Uh, but the public here has decided, seemingly decided, that having the person that's been in the office, knows the most about the office and where the backlog's at, they're going to give her a chance to be successful. All right, right. But we'll see what happens. And they're going to give her a chance. Do we have Tammy back? Oh, oh right. Tammy is right. standing let's... by. All right, let's check back in with Tammy. Hello, Tammy. <laughs> Hi, Eric and Mary. Sorry about that earlier. Obviously, it's really loud with excitement over here. I just talked to Lisa Mangan, and she is ecstatic and encouraged by these early numbers. You know, she really believes that voters were trying to resonate with her more balanced approach to restorative justice, as well as accountability, which is something that we have been talking to her a lot during her campaign. Now, right here behind me, you can see the crowd that is here at her watch party. She is here getting a lot of support support from the incumbent um, Dan Satterberg, who is retiring after 15 years in that office. She also has support here from Democratic lawmakers like Bjorn Mayor Jimmy Mata was also here. Now, her challenger, Jimmy Farrell, is the mayor of Federal Way, and he was a King County prosecutor before that for 16 years and has a lot of support from the Police Officers Guild and other labor unions. But again, Mannion says that we need a balanced approach for restorative justice and accountability to prevent event repeat offender and she believes that's what's resonating with early number voters at this time now back out here live you know whoever is going to ultimately win this race or king county prosecutor has to deal with the worst type of criminals. I mean, these are felony crimes that we're talking about. And right now, King County Superior Court has a backlog of 4,500 cases. So whoever wins that has to figure out a way to deal with that massive backlog of felony cases. Guys, back to you. All right, thanks, Tammy. So now we're looking at the Secretary of State here, and we're looking at this race, and we're seeing Hobbs, Steve Hobbs there, ahead uh, of uh, Julie Anderson by right around 40,000, give or take votes. So we've got a 1.6 million votes tallied so far, and we can see right there, you've got the total on your screen, 818,000 for Steve Hobbs, 766,000 uh, for Julie Anderson. We also had just one cross a few minutes ago, and this is something I was speaking about, uh, J.D. Vance uh, winning there in Ohio. That was a big key U.S. Senate race uh, that we've been talking about. Also, we head down to uh, Oregon, if I got control of this here. We've got a really close race for governor. Now, this is something we've also been watching very closely. Tina Kotek only has about a 10,000 vote lead over over Republican Christine Drazen. So that's a big deal for Oregon. At the same time, this is something Oregon voters are watching very closely as well. Measure 114 down there, it's said to be one of the most restrictive firearm regulations on the ballot ever. If this passes, it restricts magazines to 10 bullets per magazine. Also, a lot of different requirements coming into even buying a gun. So this is happening in Oregon right now, and that's leading by right around 18,000 votes. That's a big deal for Oregonians living down there. Uh, also, at the same time, Herschel Walker, only leading by about 1,000 votes in Georgia right now. So this is so tight. And at the same time, both candidates, 49%. No one's reached 50 or above that. So this probably means this could be a runoff election in December. It's still pretty early, but 85% of votes have been counted. So we've got a pretty good idea of what's going on there. As we head to one more key U.S. Senate race, John Fetterman versus Mehmet Oz. We still have Fetterman in the lead by about... Yeah, what is that, 50,000 votes? So it's still in the lead for Fetterman, 76% of votes counted. This is a very close, and we're going to keep watching this. We may know the results tonight. We may not. Send it back to you guys. Ron, we want to get back to that Secretary of sure. State race. A lot of people talking about election security, uh, transparency, the integrity of our elections. We talk about it every night on the news, right, Mary? And I want to ask kind of an odd question. It feels somewhat like a created news story to me at times. Have there been problems? Are we looking at a situation in this country and in this state where people, you know, are influencing elections? Is that something that's really happening? No, absolutely not. So it is a created, it is a created it, 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 story. It, it, it was a created story that came out of, that, out of the 2020 election cycle, okay? We have some of the best, in Washington State in particular, as a, a hundred years ago, I was a county auditor and used to count the ballots myself. And so our processes in, that we've set up in the state of Washington over the years have been some of the best run elections in the country. And a lot of the other states are, are our equal, okay? And unfortunate because it's, oh, it's become politicized. But the people that run our elections, and there's no more important office in terms of how those elections are conducted. Secretary than of State. Secretary of State. And so um, I think either one of these folks who are that win tonight would be you know, solid candidates to run the elections process. 
Um, and so we can have nothing and need, we have nothing but confidence here in how we conduct our, ourselves and our elections in Washington State. And I would submit to you that is absolutely the case in almost every state in this country as well. Remember back in, in 2020, there were 20 cases brought in front of 20 federal judges with trying to raise the issues of election irregularity. Every one of them were thrown out as not being valid. You know, I'm, I'm really disappointed, I'm really concerned because there's nothing more fundamental to our democracy than the people's confidence and integrity right. of our election systems. And it has been attacked like I've never seen in my career, and I think that's extraordinarily unfortunate for all of us, for all Americans. I think we need to understand we have nothing to fear, and we have nothing but the best some elections processes anywhere in the country. Well, it does not There's help, There's my lecture though. for the night. It doesn't, no, no, no. It, it, it it's doesn't great help, information. though, that every state has their own way yes. of running elections. So yes. if you've never, for example, participated in a ma mail-in ballot, you know nothing about it. Right. Uh, you, you, you believe whatever you hear about it. You have no experience with it. So it kind of lends itself to the conversation of doubt um, and, and worry and and how are they how are they making sure that, you know, th their mail-in ballots aren't... Uh, you know, was tampered, yeah, with, tampered with it anyway. And we also had that incident where those stickers went out at the mail, mail uh, at the drop boxes saying that you were under surveillance and that turned into a whole, yes, the eye roll there, Ron. Yeah. But that did exactly. turn into a whole issue of election integrity and right. people sent out uh, monitors, right, to make sure right. that that wasn't what was happening. Listen, they're not 100% flawless. I mean, you know, they're, 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 but the integrity of the process is that there's never been any history of any elections proved that somehow or another there's such irregularities that would change the outcome of any elections we've had in this country today. And I've surveyed, I've done elections when at the end of an election there was, they were 100% tied to electronic. And then we did a hand count and they were still 100% tied after the hand count. So you know what we had to go to? This is for a school district, a flip of a coin. <laughs> for a school district. For a school district, right? We went to a flip of the coin. But again, the validation of the process and how it works is, and, 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 and our confidence in that is so doggone important. And I believe in how we've been running our elections in this country. Yes, the vote, we've been doing vote by mail in this state for what, 25, 30? I mean, we were early adopters and we were doing it the right way. But a lot of the other states have done the same things and they're doing it the right way. We have not seen any major irregularities across this country, but we've made it such, as you point out here, it's become such a hue and cry that is now threatening the integrity yeah. of that process as a perception, not as a reality. Well, maybe a lot of this scrutiny will lead to some confidence, right? Maybe, maybe that'll maybe, be the end maybe, result. I hope here. so. What well, I, I think we should bring up before we close out this yes, issue that, yes. that this this question of election integrity is often only raised uh, by the loser. Oh of the yes, race, that's right? the you other thing. You don't ever win yes. the race and winners say I never, need a recount. I, I, I need a recount. Right? I won, but I yes. just want to make sure. Yeah. It always, you know, all those recounts that were done in the presidential, hand recounts two, three, four times, guess what? They all came out the same way again. And we've all forgotten about that. Hold on one second. I think we're going to go to Michelle Esteban. Is that correct? Michelle Esteban has been, has been following this story that we're talking about, about security and about uh, the drop boxes. She's been sort of keeping an eye on this and discussing it and learning about it pretty much all day long. Michelle, what have you found out for us? Hi there. Well, Eric, it's been really enjoyed listening to the three of you, and it really dovetails nicely with what I'm covering. One unexpected hiccup happened today, and it's a pretty big one. It's behind me. I mean, it's not big in terms of anybody's, people need to worry about their vote, no, but people showed up in droves today here at Lumen Field. What they want to do is register to vote and vote in person. More than 200 voters, as you can see, are still in line right now. The cutoff was at 8 o'clock, but they were in line in time. The average wait hour, two hours to get through the line. This is what it looked like. Let me show you some video from earlier tonight. Even more waiting. A lot of people told me they didn't get a ballot or they moved, they procrastinated, but some of them did say they just feel better about doing this in person, especially with all that election security chatter and concern that we've been hearing, especially coming from out of state. The crowd caught the King County elections folks, though I got to say by surprise, they have four voting centers 
and folks have been here all day waiting outside. So they had to actually bring in at the last minute, it was like around 3.30, bring in more workers. They brought in food, they brought in water, and they finally brought everybody inside. One thing I'm so impressed with is how resilient people are. Despite the wait, people made sure their vote counts. I just feel safer doing it this way. And uh, I moved recently, so I didn't get my mail-in ballot. I had not received anything in the mail, um, so I figured that I needed to go in person. I'm a procrastinator, and yeah, I forgot till last minute. Now, there were two hiccups earlier today when two of the ballot drop boxes appeared to be full. Voters were concerned, worried about loose ballots. They reported it. Crews got to both of them, emptied them. This is one that's in, uh, on Beacon Hill. The other one was in West Seattle. Some of the boxes, we understand, are so busy, crews have to dump them or empty them securely six times a day. Typically, it is twice. Another layer of security, election workers were staffing every drop box tonight from 6 to 8 o'clock. Now, back out here live. Uh, I don't know how much longer it's going to take, probably a couple more hours, but you can see they've brought in a lot of pizza, they've brought in a lot of water. They're really trying to take care of the voters um, who waited till today, like you heard from them, many of them procrastinating until the last minute. But I don't think anybody, guys, got turned away. Everybody heeded that call. They got here by 8 o'clock. And of course, what time is it now? It's like almost 9 o'clock, and we're still going strong. Probably got at least another one or two hours here. That's the very latest. We'll throw it back to you. All right, thanks, Michelle. So now we're taking a look with the latest numbers here. This is Snohomish County prosecuting attorney's race, and right now we still have Democrat Jason Cummings ahead of Brett Rogers by about 27,000 votes. So it's still pretty early right now, 104 to 76. Uh, this, these are numbers that are going to continue to change throughout the evening. This was pretty much the first batch. It really hasn't changed much from the first time we told you this. But again, Jason Cummings here uh, running against Brett Rogers. Now, Jason Cummings became the chief civil deputy prosecutor uh, in the county's prosecutor office in 2007 has been with the office since 1999 now rogers is uh is a was a lieutenant with the seattle police department and uh, was admitted to the washington state bar in 2008 so a pretty good race uh, it's pretty tight at this point we're going to continue to follow this and get more developments as the night progresses we're going to go live now to bellevue where we're told that senator maria cantwell is now introducing senator patty murray who looks to be running away with her election tonight let's join and see if we can take a listen Be careful there. Oh my God, thank you. You guys, we did it. We did it. Oh my God, it's so wonderful to see all of you. Thank you all so much for being here. Look, we still have some results coming in from around the country, but I gotta say, Washington State, Thank you. <laughs> to, <laughs> to everyone who's here tonight and to those who are not, all of you who knocked on doors and made phone calls, all of you who donated and texted and did everything you could or just, just watched, no matter what you did, you threw yourself into this fight to keep our democracy a democracy. <laughs> You all sent a message using your voice and your votes to determine the direction of this country. And I am so proud and I'm so grateful to every single one of you. From the bottom of my heart, thank you all so much for sending me back to be your voice again in the United States Senate. I'm so proud. I am so proud to work for all of you. Thank you. 
You know, I, I just have to say the last year of, and a half of campaigning has taken me to every single part of the state, and at every single campaign stop, I'd meet someone who would come up to me, and maybe they just, can I just have a minute of time? And I heard so many stories across the state, stories that gave me such hope and are so inspiring to me and give me so much optimism for our future. <laughs> There was a, a dad in Everett uh, who told me that his son, because of the PACT Act, that makes sure that if you are exposed to toxics overseas and you're a veteran, you'll get taken care of when you're home, said he was in tears because his son was now taken care of. I saw an old friend, Deborah Parker, up in the, from the Tulalip tribes. She and I worked forever to re rewrite the uh, Violence Against Women Act and make sure it protected women on tribal lands. And she gave me these beautiful earrings to remind me we get things done. I actually, I actually ran into my kid's middle school teacher when I was campaigning out in Mason County, and I met someone who was in my preschool class many years ago when I taught preschool, who now, of course, has kids this age, but that's great. Um, all of you kept me going. All of you kept me going through those 80-degree days, through those smoke-filled skies, through the rain, the snow, everything we've seen. Thank you so much. It was your work that got this done. You know, and I, as I told you as I campaigned, the stakes of this election are so high. And voters in Washington showed up. Thank you. You all showed up to make sure Washington State had a voice in the Senate that would fight to codify Roe into law and make sure every woman in this country has that right. You showed up to make sure we had a, would protect this democracy for future generations and fight so that every American's voice would be heard in the elections. You showed up to do that. You all showed up so that we could keep building an economy that works for families like every one of yours, not giant corporations and billionaires. You know, I've always said elections need to be about a candidate's ideas and their values and their accomplishments. Do you all think that we should finally let Medicare negotiate lower drug costs? Do you believe that climate change is real and it's time to take action? Do you believe that everyone should be able to count on Social Security? Well, you showed up for that. And let me just say, do you think Mitch McConnell should be the leader of the U.S. Senate? We are going to make sure he is not. <laughs> you know, the choice really couldn't have been more clear in this election. And Washington, I think you made the right choice. Thank you. I know... Most of you know my story by now that I got involved in politics because a legislator in Olympia told me that you're just a mom in tennis shoes and you can't make a difference. I would like you to look at my family <laughs> behind me. We make a difference. <laughs> right? And you all made a difference. You made yourselves heard with your voices and your vote, and we won. And I am ready to go back to the Senate to keep on fighting for our families, the ones like yours and mine. And I want to just say to all of you who don't know, I grew up in a family of nine. This is only about a third of them behind me. <laughs> <laughs> to the rest of you that are out there, thank you for being in my heart and being a part of this. And to all of my family behind me, I couldn't be where I am without you. It takes a village, and I got one. Thank you. So I want you.
you to know you can keep on counting on me to do everything I can to keep lowering the cost of prescription drugs and health care and tackle the affordable housing crisis. And by the way, as I was on my way down here, President Biden called me <laughs> to congratulate me, yes. which I appreciated. But I said, thank you, Joe. And by the way, we now need to get child care done. <laughs> You know, we have a lot of work to do. We need to get our children's learning back on track. We need to invest in mental health care. We need to tackle the substance use crisis. But you all gave me the ability now to go back and take your voices and be your vote and your champion in the United States Senate to get that done. And I want you to know, I so appreciate it. I so appreciate all of you in Washington State for giving me the honor of being your voice and your vote and fighting for you every single day. To my staff, and there are many out here today, you worked your hearts out. You worked your hearts out. To all of you who went out and voted or made calls or did just, just were there, thank you so much. Thank you for being here. And again, to my family, I couldn't be there without all of you. So thank you so much for being here tonight. And I especially want to thank my husband, Rob. <laughs> Many of you may know um, that we did an awful lot of GOT events in every corner of the state. Rob was there for every single one of them. <laughs> so we got our work to do. We need to protect reproductive rights. We need to protect this democracy. We need to take this night and go to work and keep on working for all of you. That's my pledge to all of you. And again, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's keep winning across the country so we can have 52 Democratic senators. That's my goal. There she is, the mom in tennis shoes keeps rolling along. Uh, she just wins convincingly. Uh, it seems election after election, hugging some of her family members right there tonight. A big night, and you could tell in her voice, an emotional night. An, an, an emotional night for Senator Patty Murray as she wins this race going away. All right, let's go check in now with <laughs> Tiffany Smiley's campaign. She is at, on the stage about to address her supporters there. Uh, let's take a listen. An even better person. We are so grateful for her, for Scotty, the whole Smiley family, and people that are willing to serve. So please, Tiffany, thank you so much for your campaign and all the hope you've given. And we're going to keep the faith. So go ahead. Thank you all. You know, I want to start this out um, thanking each and every one of you who believed along with me over 18 months ago that Washington State was worth fighting for. Um, I, yeah. I love this state. Um, the good Lord put me in this state, and we are going to stay and fight for this state. But I want to thank all of you, each and every one of you. What we have done here is truly remarkable. Um, when I started calling you guys over 18 months ago, you're like, Tiffany who? <laughs> Maybe some of you hung up on me, but I called you back. And then you answered. But, um, you know, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you to my family who stood behind me, my, my amazing husband. Where are you, Scotty? <laughs> My amazing husband who told me My amazing husband who told me there's one person in Washington say who could be Patty Murray and I hate to tell you honey but it's you. And I'm behind you all the way. You know, we faced insurmountable odds in our life. Um, we've, we've taken them head on, 
and overcome at every point. Um, we are no stranger to difficulties, um, and we also know the power of coming together and bringing people together with one vision and one goal, and that's to improve people's lives. Um, and that's exactly what we are doing here in Washington State. So to my family, to my, my kids, um, I only have two of them here. Baylor and Graham are here with us. Um, <laughs> Grady, our oldest, is in school and in driver's training, which is so important for our family. I need him. <laughs> Um, but to my, my sisters, my nieces, my nephews, our family, um, they're everything to me. And um, we know what we're fighting for. We know why we're fighting. And I couldn't do this without them, um, who have been behind me, standing in the gap at every turn, taking care of my kids, giving rides. We're here because we love this country. We love this state. <laughs> And there is always hope. There is always hope. And, you know, as I've toured across my bus over the last 15 days, just story after story of, of people whose lives we have touched, um, who want hope, who need hope. Um, I'll never forget a little Down syndrome boy just came running up to me, and he just reached out to me like, I want you, and I grabbed him, and I picked him up, and um, I, he laid his head on my shoulder, and I said, I'm fighting for you, and he shook his head, yes, and then he s brought his head off my shoulder, and he looked at me, and he smiled, and he gave me a thumbs up. You know, I'll never forget just the mom who grabbed me in a crowd and said, I lost two of my boys um, this summer to fentanyl. Um, Keep fighting. Please keep fighting. Um, <laughs> we knew this road would not be easy. I didn't get into this because it was going to be easy. I get, got into this knowing it would be a fight and that it would be really, really hard. So I'm not disappointed with anything that I'm seeing tonight, because 50, over 50% 50 of the vote is still out, folks. <laughs> so I, I'm not easily intimidated, if you don't know that already. <laughs> and I always stand close to my convictions, and I stand close to the fact that Washington State does not need seniority. We need motivation and principle. And our family will never stop fighting for that. So thank you to each and every one of you from the bottom of our family's heart. This is, this is remarkable. I love this state. Thank you. Thank you. I love you guys. I love you. I, you know, want to thank my incredible team. Many of you have gotten to know them over this last 18 months. Incredible people. Um, I, I have to say, we have run the best campaign in the country. <laughs> and 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 it's it, it's to my team who many of you know. Like, thank you. They're they're out here. They're around. They're all over. Um, they work hard. They're dedicated to the mission, and we have one vision and one goal on this campaign, and that's to improve the lives of others. And they've embodied that on every level, have stood by me in the tough times and the good times, <laughs> and kept driving on at every turn. So um, I'm an eternal optimist. It's how God made me. <laughs> and this is not over yet. I have a strong team. We're here to win. As you all know, in Washington State, it takes several days um, to know the close of our elections here. So, um, you know, we're confident that when every legal vote is counted, um, that we can turn the tide here in Washington State. Our team is going, yep. 
our team is going to continue to work hard with our friends at the Was Washington State Republican um, Party to ensure that every single legal vote is counted. Um, and there is still so much out there. So there is hope, Washington State. There is always hope. Um, and please know that we are so deeply grateful um, for each and every one of you. I have met so many incredible Washingtonians. We, you know, unfortunately, we're underrepresented on the national stage, but um, it's not always going to be like that. So thank you for joining me in this fight. We still have a long ways to go. But Washington State, I'm here to fight all the way to the end. So join me in this fight for Washington State. Thank you. Tiffany Smiley, cheerful and even hopeful in what is almost certainly a defeat, thanking her supporters. She says she loves the state of Washington. She says there is always hope. She did not, as you heard, concede, despite trailing by 200,000 plus votes. She did not congratulate Patty Murray. Maybe that's for another day. We shall see what happens. We're heading back to our digital show now that's airing on our website, comonews.com. Of course, we'll also have in-depth analysis on the races there. We'll see you there. Well, it's been quite a night already, hasn't it? Results steadily pouring in as the future of the U.S. Congress hangs in the balance. We've got our eye on the pivotal Senate race between Tiffany Smiley and longtime Senator Patty Murray. Smiley did not concede uh, the, the victory to Patty Murray. Doesn't seem to matter. Patty Murray thanking her supporters. And I thought she seemed about as emotional and as fired up as I've ever seen She was Patty emotional. Murray. She was exuberant. And the way she said, we did it, yeah. I felt like I picked up a touch of relief with the exuberance and the emotion that she showed us on stage. It was, it was vintage, Patty Murray. Um, I have not seen the, even that energy during the campaign. It was, I think you all said it, she was almost relieved because the, the perception of uh, the tightening race and then to have the numbers that she's gotten so far this evening has is, is got to make her feel very comfortable. And so, I mean, she had a really good evening. And so you saw that in her voice, in her message, in her enthusiasm, the energy. She was like, she was on it. She was really on it tonight. And so, you know, it, it's, um, it's just uh, it's, it's a good night for the Murray camp. Let Not me... such a good night for the Tiffany Smiley camp. I was a little disappointed um, that she wasn't a little more accommodating because, listen, with that kind of a margin, and you're at 57, 42, and if there's still 50%, that's not going to change of any substantial li limit. And so, and so she probably could have handled it a little bit differently, but that's that's. Her We've call. got the latest numbers, if we can see that graphic right now, yeah. you guys, and to and see and what the breakdown looks like. And as we look at these, 57% to 43%, uh, the race has been called, as you can see. Yep. But, uh, let me ask you this. Tiffany Smiley, first-time newcomer, mm -hmm. first time running for a public office, shoots for the moon, runs what most of us agree was a yes. pretty decent, solid yes. campaign, right? Stayed on point, made her points, got around the state, did her thing. Yep. What happens to someone like that? It is such a tough road for a Republican in the state of Washington. Where does someone like Tiffany Smiley go from here? Well, as we checked about chat about earlier the, the the problem and the challenge for the republicans is trying to figure out how to modify some of their positions at the end of the day tiffany smiley still represented the very conservative ideological kindred spirits of the ultra conservative republicans in washington state you know ideologically her positions on issues on choice and all the other issues that really mattered social security medicare medicaid all the sort of voting issues, um, of affordable health care, are not, are not the issues she was speaking to. Does she have a political future in the state of Washington at this point? Well, I'm she, reminded of Dino Rossi, who was much closer yeah, when he, when he yeah, ran than, than Smiley yeah. was. Um, I don't know that she does, right? Because what's considered in politics, if you win by 55% or greater, that's considered a political landslide, okay? And so while she... She did run a really solid race in many ways. 
but ideologically, she was not kindred spirits with the voters in Washington state. She was always a little out of step on the substance of the issues, in my opinion. I, I want to ask you this, then what happened? What happened with the pollsters then? Does that mean that our, our, our voters lying to pollsters? Well, when you know, they... our, our, poll, our polling had 5240. That's in the margin of error. We had a 12 point spread. Now there's this one poll that came out really late in the election that had a one point spread, but you need to pull the covers back on that a little bit, okay? That was a Republican polling firm from Atlanta, Georgia, whose methodologies have always been questioned, not only here, but in other places. Okay, so you have to be careful if you read that. That poll was not what, um, wasn't, wasn't really capturing who the voters were. And it turns out that the S360 poll, to put in a plug for us, <laughs> that our polls you was it. Much, much, much closer to where, where this thing may end up. Um, now, I, again, I have to confess, I thought the race was tightening, too. I did not think it was a one-point spread, though. I didn't, like, that, that poll, that Trafalgar... It mm -hmm. didn't ring true. It didn't right. ring true to me. Um, I did sense that there was, and I think within the Murray campaign, there was also a sense that it was tightening up. It wasn't just me. Um, but, in fact, that was not the case, and the, you know, the voters came home to where they were when we did our poll in September. Let's get to some other stuff here, Ron. Yeah. All right, here's how the state legislature is shaping up at this hour. The balance of power in the Washington House, it looks like 61 for the Democratic Party, 37 for the GOP. And, all right, here's the Senate now, 29 for the Democrats and 20 for the Republicans. And we're tracking the balance of power tonight. Come on, Denise Whitaker is live in Renton for us with more on that. Denise? Right, Republicans are certainly watching this very closely, looking for an opportunity to disrupt the balance of power that we've had to end the trifecta that Democrats had right now, controlling the governor's office, plus both sides of the legislature. So everyone's going to be watching this very closely, and this is not lost on voters who have been casting their ballots so far today. Some people barely getting them in by the last minute. A number of voters that I talked with are aware of the importance. They rushed to make sure that their vote was counted, some of them using every last second to get there before eight. This drop box is now closed. I'm not sure if I would have been so inclined to vote if I hadn't seen those ads running on YouTube. Um, that also persuaded me to do a little bit more research. So right when I got home today, I did some more research. I'm concerned for a shift in power. Um, I don't think I really like want too much of a change. The balance of power is off, and I believe that most people realize that regardless of what party they're affiliated with. And clearly we've got some young voters, Caden Crawford, for instance, voting for the very first time. Pretty excited about that. He did a lot of research with his mom, he told me. Now, looking at the Senate races in our state right now, I'm counting Democrats leading the majority of the contested seats in the Senate anyway. But here's a stat that I want you to think about. With only 50% of the votes counted so far, one quarter, one quarter of the seats that were up for re-election last time were decided by margins of 10 percent or less in the Senate in our state. So that's something to think about as these ballot drops continue to come in in the coming days. Certainly both parties watching those very, very closely, and we'll continue to bring you those results. Live in Renton tonight, Denise Whitaker, Como News. All right, thanks, Denise. As we continue to watch these numbers come down, we're looking at results nationally right now. We're keeping an eye on this Georgia race between Herschel Walker and Raphael Warnock. It only is a difference of about 1,000 votes. So right now, if Republicans really want to take control of the Senate and get ahead, that 52 that they really need to have, they're going to need to win these key states, this Georgia, Arizona, and other spots, uh, possibly Pennsylvania, where we're looking at right now. I can bring that up for you because I've been looking at this and watching this very closely. With John Fetterman and Mehmet Oz, we've got about a 40,000 vote difference here right now the way the Senate's looking is it's 46 46 and with the House is looking at about 25 plus Republicans ahead of the Democrats and that's the way it's looking at this point before we move on to the actual end result here but I'm going to take one more look at Oregon here because this is a very interesting race to watch as well we've got a Democrat that's only leading the Republican by about 17,000 votes this is pretty interesting stuff uh, pretty close here for Christine Drazen there uh, in Oregon so we're going to keep watching this throughout the evening bring, keep bringing you updates and we'll have all the latest on this, of course, on Como News tonight at 11 o'clock.
All right, we're going to wrap it up here in just a second. But before we say good night to our digital viewers and all of you out there, thank you for hanging out with us. It's right. been fascinating. I think we've all learned a lot. Ron, your final thoughts about what we've seen transpire tonight? Well, it's been an interesting. I, I think that everybody's a little bit surprised about the margin in the U.S. Senate race right now with Senator Murray, and and that's a big takeaway. The the legislative races look pretty bold for the Democrats. So, generally speaking, it looks like the days are going to hold serve in the midterm election in Washington State as we sit here right now. Not uh, shockingly. Not shockingly, no. All right, thanks, Ron. Thanks so much for your analysis. We always appreciate that. Thank you so much for joining us here on ComeOnNews.com. Again, we'd also like to thank Ron Dotsauer from Strategies 360. <laughs> we'll continue to break into programming on Como TV, and we will have more extensive coverage online and complete analysis coming up on Como News at 11 o'clock. We'll see you then. Thanks for hanging out.